As war clouds gathered towards the end of 1939, the Royal Navy's fleet air arm was ill-equipped as far as frontline aircraft were concerned. It lacked modern machines, and its mainstay torpedo strike aircraft was itself based on a 1930 specification, virtually obsolescent even before it went into service. This outdated strike aircraft was nonetheless to cover itself in glory. It was the fairy swordfish. Incredible as it may seem, this relic of the biplane era was still in successful service nearly 10 years later. But the string bag, as it became affectionately known, was all the Navy had to go to war with, and war it was. Amazingly, when peace was finally declared over five long years later, a total of almost 2,400 swordfish had accounted for the destruction of more enemy shipping tonnage than any other aircraft flown by the Allied forces. Its outstanding success was the result of two basic facts. Firstly, the swordfish was almost exclusively deployed in environments where the possibility of attack from modern land-based fighters was minimal. And secondly, it had almost viceless handling qualities and superb control characteristics. All this, and much more, led this tough, if antique, biplane to contribute hugely to the victory with a capital V. The oldest surviving swordfish, the Blackburn-built W5856, has been lovingly restored to a standard probably better than new. Initially, the swordfish was designed and built at the Ferry Aviation Factory at Hayes in Middlesex, from which completed aircraft had their tails hoisted onto truck tailboards and were towed backwards for flight trials to the company's Great West Aerodrome, now London's Heathrow Airport. This prototype swordfish, originally known as TSR-2, first flew in April 1934. In flight, it was stable and docile, if slow, and the ideal mount for a pilot with no experience of the type. Well, I just, uh, I just got in and flew, flew it. I, I can't remember having, having any flying experience with it. I suppose when it was filled up with pilots and observers and and uh, radar and radio and what have you and everything else. I, I don't know. About 90 knots, I suppose. I mean, if you get a good, if you got a good um, uh, blow of wind, I remember a friend of mine, Alexander, told me when they were moving, moving uh, from one station to another, and there was a hell of a hell of a wind got up, and they were absolutely. Uh, full up to the gunnels with equipment and everything else belonging to the squadron. So the bicycle strapped to the side and what have you. You know, something like it in your life. Talk about a Christmas tree. And uh, with the wind blowing like that, yes, the car, the car, uh, the cars were going faster. After producing 692 swordfish, Ferries had a pressing requirement to develop its successor, the Albacore. And so swordfish production was transferred to Blackburn aircraft. Ironically, the swordfish outlived the albacore operationally. It was not long before the Sherburn in Elmet plant, where Blackburns were to build what were to be known as Blackfish, set up extensive production lines well away from any enemy bombing threat. Rows upon rows of fuselage and wing skeletons were soon taking shape, for the Blackburn company was to produce nearly three times more swordfish than fairies. The new production plant was established towards the end of 1940 between Leeds and Selby, 
and the first Blackburn-built swordfish was test flown on the 1st of December the same year. In many ways, the original site has changed little over the years, apart from its tenants, one of which is the successful Sherburn Aero Club. This had, as part of its beginnings, prominent members of the Blackburn family as founders. Peak production reached 60 swordfish per month. Test pilot H.P. Wilson flew the last from this field on the 18th of August, 1944. Today, about 200 people who used to work at the factory still live locally. Ellis Pugh, a maintenance electrician who helped set it up, is one and tells of the early days. Well, when I went down there in 1940, well, there were only about uh, two, four, about eight of us down there then, because there was still building. And there was building, at, more or less at the same time, in sections where they were doing uh, the uh, sawfish. Uh, they brought the skeleton sawfish in uh, as a copy for us all to look at, just the fuselage. And uh, from then on, they started employing people. And I remember the first plane going out <coughs> because uh, there was the manager and the lads was pushing the plane that there was made for the first time to go out. And then they took it outside and put the uh, petrol in, tested it, and, uh, and everybody cheered and away it went, the first one. To be followed by another 1,698 Blackburn Blackfish. In fact, it was maintained that pilots could distinguish between a fairy and a Blackburn-built swordfish, but history doesn't record which they thought the better. Having seen service not only in the UK, but with the Canadian Navy too, W5856 was discovered in a field after a period of crop spraying in Canada and found its way to the Strathallan collection in Scotland. In 1990, British Aerospace acquired this, the oldest existing swordfish, for restoration and eventual presentation to the Royal Navy Historic Flight. Already partly restored by enthusiasts at Strathallan, 5856 left Scotland bound for Humberside. So it was that two truckloads containing a collection of partly restored components and sub-assemblies, together with assorted car boot debris, headed south. Four hundred miles later, the convoy arrived at the British Aerospace Bruff factory, more used to turning out Hawk trainers and major Airbus components. Mike Jackson begins an assessment. What we've got here is, is the basic fuselage. Um, the superstructure, metallically, is very, very good. But because this is a flying aeroplane, we're concerned about some of the wood. As we know, it is a skilled task, and under those circumstances, we'll be looking for the kind of skills, the kind of people, and the companies that are able to do this kind of activity.
many detailed components looked for all the world as if they'd been dredged up from the Titanic. Graham Chisnell is British Aerospace's director and chief engineer and explains the challenge. The swordfish will pose a considerable challenge for British Aerospace in that it represents uh, a type of construction which is long gone and compared to hawks and buccaneers which this side is familiar with, it is built up from many, many small components and represents skills which we will have to reacquire trying to um, retain as much of the original structure as we acquired from the museum and in addition we're trying to proceed as quickly as we can and build on the work that the Strathallan collection did. Overall the job poses a considerable challenge. Charged with initially assessing the restoration ahead, Gregory Featherstone begins by carefully hand-cleaning all assemblies and usable components, likening it to antique restoration. Uh, this is a stub wing, and um, all the paint on the spars in, in the internal structure is all flecking off. All you can do is just remove it by hand. There's no machine you can do it with. It's got to be, you know, just all meticulously rubbed down. It's quite a laborious job. It's a long job to do it all. Key to checking just how corroded and indeed damaged the structure is, the various non-destructive testing procedures available today hardly existed 25 years ago, let alone 50 when this swordfish was first built. Fortunately, British Aerospace is in the forefront of this technology and its facilities are readily available. An industrial use of the well-proven medical X-ray technique can look inside a structure by producing an image on a plastic film that can be viewed on a light box. 5856's cracked and worn limbs will show up just like yours and mine would in a hospital. Not only this, but hidden corrosion, the arch enemy of all alloy aircraft structures, will be revealed. Another clever means of internal inspection uses a magic eye. Dennis Lockwood explains. This is the application of uh, non-destructive testing. The, the most important part, I think, is the visual. And we're applying this to the rear spar. Uh, it's a, not a very high-tech device, but it does enable us to look in the nooks and crannies, uh, which otherwise we'd have to x-ray or uh, guess. <laughs> Yet another method is magnetic particle testing, and David Syme is the expert. OK, what we'll do first is we spray on a white background paint, which creates a contrast between the black ink. Black ink is made of magnetic particles, extremely small. We then apply a magnetic force around the component, and as the force is applied using an AC magnetic coil, magnetic particles thump around any defects or inclusion that may be in the component. These defects or inclusions are probably there from its original manufacture. Currently, the only airworthy swordfish in the UK is at HMS Heron at Yeovilton, home of the Royal Navy Historic Flight. The British Aerospace team paid an early visit to discuss Navy requirements in order to make the new swordfish as compatible as possible and to discuss matters of mutual interest. OK, right. If I can really close the meeting up with a summary, uh, what we've done is we've got the survey status of the plane. We, uh, we're told you've completed the wings and the power unit, yes? Yes, yes sir. Right. 
Fuse large, ten percent complete. Did you say? Yes. And you've experienced no big, no major no big problems. Okay. The other main problem is your exhaust collector ring. Uh, I would say that we've got an exhaust collector ring here. We have right? a spare town. We need to repair done. Uh, need to repair. Uh, we could send it up for them to look at and decide whether they want to use it. Right, okay. Lastly, and most importantly, the Yeovilton saltfish was carefully inspected, with the British Aerospace team familiarising themselves with a flying example. Many details for which no known drawings exist were photographed, making invaluable reference shots. Back at Bruff, John Owens is one of the only three British aerospace engineers permanently engaged on 5856's restoration. The major problem we found after x-raying, x-raying the, the spars, was that we found corrosion showing up between the two laminations of the two spars. And how we've tackled that is by putting a laminated piece over the top of it, which we'll, dem we'll demonstrate to you in a minute how we've done it. And what we've got to do is put a, a section round the outside of the spar to reinforce it. And how we've done that is by making a section up like, the, like that to actually clip round. And it's very important that it clips down tightly as that is. Now, the method we've used to actually make, make the, the spar repair is very, very simple. What we've actually done is got two lengths a mild steel bar, weld it to, just chuck weld it together and just pull it up quite simply by just pulling them up round to form a section tightly round it. Simple as hell, very effective. Like any permanent splint, the finished article is probably better than new, stronger and very little heavier. To preserve the aerofoil shape of the wing at the vital leading edge region, where the airflow is laminar, extra riblets are fitted. These are delicate but essential and have to be made with precision. They fit between the main wing ribs and have to be accurately secured, which is not always easy. What a contrast the swordfish's construction is compared with today's strike aircraft, which by comparison seem to be almost carved from the solid metal. But for its day, the swordfish was as rugged and reliable as any currently flying. Back in the 1940s, rib assembly was mainly a task for the many ladies drafted in to help with the war effort. British aircraft carriers, their planes and personnel have already many fine exploits to their credit in several theatres of war. They have greatly profited from the experience gained in action against the Germans and they have maintained the highest degree... So of famous did the swordfish become during the war that its daring and conclusive exploits were regularly reported, especially in the cinema. Down in the Mediterranean, the fleet and the fleet air arm have been the dominant factor since Italy decided the time had come to enter the war. Their greatest achievement to date is, of course, the crippling of the Italian battle fleet at Taranto, when the fleet air arm put 50% of Mussolini's battleships out of action, including one of his two brand new 30 nutters, it meant that our Mediterranean fleet was now numerically superior. At the Fleet Air Arm Museum at Yeovilton, there is a diorama of the Battle of Taranto, showing the tight balloon defence system through which the two ways of attacking swordfish had to duck and weave. A swordfish observer on the raid, Lieutenant Alfie Sutton, tells how it was done. We approached the Taranto from the northwest and then dived down in the middle of the defences uh, where the enemy put a box barrage ahead of us, terrific mass of bursting shells to which we had to fly. And then uh, down onto the water, we came down a little bit too soon, up over the masts of some cruisers which were close to the battleships, and then down again, motoring in towards the battleship anchorage. 
my pilot Torrance Bentz released the torpedo against the battleship the, the Torio and it didn't come off. He recocked and the, then released the second time, by which time the enemy battleship just about covered the whole horizon and there was a mass of stabbing flame at us as we were at the whole ship was firing and all the ships round were firing at us too. We were at an incredible cross point of fire. And then, having dropped the torpedo, a, a steep bank away to starboard and away. As we got away, a great smash and we thought we were down. But we weren't. We'd hit the water with the wheels of the fixed undercarriage and John Spence, who was an expert pilot, threw us out of the water and uh, then we picked our way through the barrage balloon by flying between two floats which we could see on the water and then out and away and back to the ship. The result of the operation was that we lost two aircraft. One ahead of us was shot down, but for that we sank three enemy battleships. The immediate effect was that the British, therefore, had predominance in the Eastern Mediterranean for about the next year. Now, this operation was a very in intense and frightening experience. When one got back to the ship, one had a great sense of relief, and then one felt absolutely shattered like a piece of chewed string when one realised what one had been through. As restoration progressed, so major components of the soon-to-be new swordfish, so lovingly restored, could be laid out for all to see and admire. Wings in particular, four in all, plus the top stub wing atop the fuselage, closely resemble a giant model aircraft. But among the more important visitors to witness ever-increasing progress were those from today's fleet air arm, for whom this project was finally destined they would discuss many topics and agree on mutual help. As these mutual get-togethers progressed, so difficulties were overcome and greater collaboration entered into. Lasting links of friendship so common in aviation were forged. Okay. W5856's tailplane and elevator were in such poor shape as was much of the rear of the biplane, that it had to be virtually rebuilt from scratch. But such was the versatility and persistence of those dedicated enthusiasts involved in this restoration project that new skills were quickly learned in an age of computers and stressed skin. Family's day at Bruff is always a time for young and old alike to see for themselves the achievements of those who today work at the former Blackburn plant, now part of British Aerospace. Examples of current projects are on display with a chance to chat on informal terms to bosses and workers alike. But at the 1991 event, there was an added attraction, the largely renewed skeleton of the oldest existing swordfish proudly displayed alongside advanced technology hawks in production for the world's air forces. But why do they build the hawks upside down, Dad? Easy, son, because they fly upside down. And after the breathtaking red arrows comes a wide variety of aircraft, old and new. A Sea King from the Royal Navy. the Blackburn B-2 trainer from the 30s. The latest show-stopping Harrier. And even a grounded tornado. The amphibious American PBY Catalina with coastal command in World War II had close wartime links with the swordfish.
The sinking of the Bismarck was due to the cooperation of the RAF with the Navy. It was a Catalina aircraft, for instance, that did much of the shadowing. When word was passed later to the Western Mediterranean squadron, British sea power had already gathered its strength to destroy the pride of the Nazi Navy. Admiral Somerville and his staff, working out the position, decided that an attack should be made by the fleet air arm, and from Ark Royal, pitching heavily, swordfish torpedo bombers took off. We know the success achieved by them in slowing up the Bismarck, and we also know the punishment handed out by Admiral Tuddy. In this, perhaps the most dramatic naval film ever taken, you will see salvos from the Bismarck failing to hit one of our battleships. This was during the chase right across the Atlantic, while the Nazi ship was running from the guns of our squadron. Telegraphist air gunners, or TAGs, Les Sayre and John Griffith, recall the Bismarck attack. It's, long, it's rather a long while ago, of course, but uh, I can recall that it was not, not very nice weather from the Victorious, and uh, we were hanging about for many hours waiting to see whether we were going to have to go or not. And eventually we did, and it was a pretty rough ride out. And uh, I was flying with Percy Jack. I thought, this is for real, it's not practice. <laughs> and when we went, when we were on our way out, we were, we were alone, uh, right down on sea level, and the Bismarck then saw us and sh gave us everything, the whole lot, you know, the main armament, and the splashes from the main armament blew out the bottom of the, the aircraft, so we had a cold trip back as well. <laughs> we, we went in once, and he wasn't quite lined up, and he said we was going around again. I knew this because you could see the torpedo through a hole in the bottom of the aircraft, see the drum, and we turned away violently and it was still there, and I thought it had stuck up. <laughs> but of course it hadn't, and we went round again. I, I think you, do, you had a lot of courage to do that, but he, he was an incredible man. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't quite right. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's frightening. In gratitude for what they gave to us, we commend to your merciful keeping the telegraphist air gunners who laid down their lives in the service of their country in the Second World War. Each year, there is a TAG's memorial service, with many originals still happily present. At this time, old comrades remember those who gave their lives and watch again a string bag in the air. ...separation with the hope of reunion in glory with all those who have gone before us. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Jimmy Edkins, who worked for the old Bristol Aeroplane Company, was a Pegasus engine troubleshooter with the squadrons. I was one of the troubleshooter service engineers, mostly on modifications. Well, when we first came up to Sherbourne, there were what, I wouldn't like to say how many, probably 50 to 100 planes grounded here at Sherbourne. So we came up to clear them. Uh, I know that we arrived approximately 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon, went into the factory, and we didn't come out for six weeks. But we got that lot cleared up. I was working 36 hours on, 12 off, between 10 of us. But uh, the modifications we had to do, we had to get them going to get aircraft mobile.
Peter Dean has become an expert on the Pegasus engine, built by Bristol, now a component part of Rolls-Royce aero engines. Uh, we went down to Yeovilton and uh, acquired all the Pegasus engine parts that we could uh, find down there. And as you can see, this is uh, a bunch of the total uh, uh, amount that they have. You can see that um, there's several parts down here. There's some crankshafts, which we're, uh, we'll have a look at to, to see if they're serviceable. And uh, there's some rocker brackets there, which we will have to strip and uh, check to see if they're serviceable. Um, you can see there's other parts there, which is the, the pushrod tubes, which we uh, have to look at. Uh, there's quite a few of them that are uh, damaged, so we have to sort through them to make sure that we can get a serviceable set out, out of them. Um, down the end, you can see there's spare crankshafts and crankcases. Just here is parts of a supercharger, which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll again we'll uh, uh, look at to see if we can uh, do anything with them as far as building up. Uh, serviceable engine. So, how's the restoration going so far? Very well indeed, actually. Um, we're going well on with the wings now. Um, the fuselage is um, taking shape um, and we've got the bulk of the fabric covered panels completed. Um, so overall, we're just uh, wetting the engine and then the um, electrical installation to complete. Um, we've used the Leon Solent aircraft as a template because of the uh, lack of drawings and information. It's been a good guide for the guys who can just use it as a reference aid. One of the Swordfish's four completed wings has been corrosion proofed and painted and internal components and fittings will be bolted on. The use of modern day materials will greatly enhance both durability and reliability. Internal wiring is installed last and the wing is ready for covering. Such was its condition that all original wiring was discarded. Is Andy coming back? Yes. Yeah. Maurice Moore is a resident quality assurance inspector from the Ministry of Defence. As each job is completed, so it is meticulously checked. They've all been out of the next reg then, DT, No hassles with the any of this. Any problems with the spars, I mean, Only on, on, on the end of the bottom, what we've done, there's two tubes, short tubes, which is inserted inside. Yeah. Well, on the bottom one, we actually pulled them right out, and we've gone in about three foot. Yeah, put an extra, extra in, and it's actually up about three gauges. By the second half of 1992, as more components were going on the aircraft than being taken off, the restoration process was gathering pace. Here, the standard 155-gallon fuel tank is being fitted. Sometimes extra tanks were installed in the rear cockpit for special duties and ferry flights. Again, modern technology is used in instrument calibration under the watchful eye of John Bowes. Normal duties of the department are development of the Hawks. They're 100 and 200. But uh, this particular job we're doing now with the Swordfish is uh, particularly interesting because it's a different generation of instruments. The old pneumatic altimeters have been replaced by electronic units, uh, engine pressure, instrument is all digital nowadays whereas the old analog systems although they were particularly reliable they're not what the pilot wants to see anymore the artificial horizon vacuum driven well we don't come across this much nowadays and again the airspeed indicator we're going really back to basics now with the pneumatics although modern ones to revert back to the original philosophy of uh, an impact pressure going into the system we can't really get away from the fact that the aircraft's moving through the air and that's the only means of checking it with the impact pressure into the pitot system. Five eight five six's first all-weather mission was a quick dash from its hangar across the apron on dead reckoning. For both safety and convenience, the swordfish reborn was painted in the Bruff fire station. But it didn't come out red or on fire. It's back to Scotland now, and a picturesque corner of Musselburgh near Edinburgh. <laughs> 
and one company that knows a thing or two about bracing wires and flying control cables is Brontons. So does Jack Stewart. This machine was uh, designed and manufactured by Brontons over 50 years ago, and it was probably used in the original manufacture of the streamlines for the first swordfishes. You start with a round bar, then it's flattened, then it's shaped into a groove, and it's stretched to the size it's required on the specification. And after each batch, the wire is tested at the, our test house, and it roughly has a breaking point of about 74 tonne. Testing is also carried out on the stranded control cables to check the strength of the crimped ends. But before cable ends were crimped, they used to be spliced and Edna Copley used to do it. Well, I trained at um, Leeds, Blackburn's at Leeds, and then when they opened, I came and, uh, down to Sherburn, and uh, I, I was uh, splicing then at Sherburn. For, the, um, for ah. the flying controls, I spliced for those. And uh, whilst I was doing that one night, Jean Batten, she used to come quite often to collect them after it'd been the final uh, inspection had been given for them and she used to come and collect them and uh, go along, take them along then to the base where they had to go to. And uh, one night she gave me an autograph, photograph of herself and an autograph which I was very proud to receive. <laughs> Happy times. Emerging from the hangar, a completed wing is about to be weighed prior to covering. Weight is the enemy of flight, and every unnecessary pound will penalize aircraft performance. But final assembly is approaching and completion in sight. Newly tested instruments are trial fitted to 5856's panel by Peter Hatch and care has been taken to exactly mirror the layout and positioning which exists in the Yeovilton swordfish. In this way, pilot disorientation between the two can be avoided. Meanwhile, the delicate process of weighing this wing and all other major sub-assemblies takes place using scales hanging from a suitable gantry. Simple but effective. Anxious eyes patiently wait for the suspended wing to gently return to earth. Lower it down now. Don't want it hanging too well. <laughs> like a lot of clever ladies, Margaret Bennett had a passion for sewing and has always lived in the Sherburn area. Many is the string bag she has sewn together, and she was one of dozens on the old Blackburn production line. The war broke out, had to cut another job, so I didn't have to go away from home. Blackburn's was near, so I got a job down there, covering the wings, and then hand sewing. They all used to be sewn. They all used to be hand sewn with uh, thread waxed. It all had to be waxed. The Sherburn factory in the 40s is not far removed from the Brough fire station 50 years later, where today's wing covering takes place. Today, Dave and Patricia Fenton stretch, stitch and dope fabric for a living and perpetuate those old intricate skills in these days of bent tin and rivets. We've learned a lot. We learn something new every day on this job. But the fundamental problem is the material you're actually working with, that it's a linen fabric. It's, it's fairly heavy and there's 
there's virtually no stretch in it, there's no give in it, as it were. So the, the tension that you see now on the wing is what you must have. The, the dough won't work miracles. So the tighter you can get the fabric now at this stage in, in the covering, uh, the better is, is the end product is going to be. Because the dope will only shrink it a small percentage um, to make it tight enough to be airworthy. So we've got to do the rest by pulling, stretching um, at this stage. That's, that's the biggest single fundamental problem, I think. And then there are the mechanics of, of the job that it's it's on a fairly large scale. So with only the two of us, we can't do things as quickly as perhaps we'd like. So we're stuck with having raw fabric in this state for maybe a day or two days, which is not recommended. Um, so we have to control temperature and humidity fairly carefully. Patricia lets us into the secrets of how to stitch aircraft fabric. Stitching's the um, easiest and most effective way of, of putting on the bag. You can get more tension from the stitches. They're an um, eighth of an inch apart with a lock stitch every couple of inches. It's um, a waxed cotton thread, which is easy to pull through, and a curved needle, which makes it a lot easier. I quite enjoy it. It's very satisfying, it's fabric work. It's a magical process when it all tightens up. You're never quite sure what it's going to come out like. Whether the bag you've spent several evenings sewing up is going to fit. Leather work plays its part too. Hugh McRae lives in Oxfordshire and is an aircraft interior expert. But modern day regulations have to be adhered to even for 50-year-old aeroplanes. Well, obviously the materials they used to, to fill the cushions before don't meet the new standards for the CAA regulations, so I've obviously conformed with the new standards to, for filling for the cushions and things like that. There's three seats in the, obviously to be done in the swordfish and uh, paddings for around the cockpit. Uh, various sharp edges have to be padded in pieces like this. This is the old one, which we're now constructing the, the newer parts. Altogether, three coats of dope are laboriously brushed on and rubbed down before the final finish is applied. Meanwhile, back at Bristol, Peter Dean has news for us. This is the start of the engine uh, assembly process now. This is the, the mountain ring which we will now start to build the engine uh, off of. Uh, originally, we had a few cracks on here which we have now well repaired uh, and, and we have now painted it. So we'll assemble it to the stand and now we'll uh, start assembling, try assembling the rear crankcase half, which is uh, that section. major components of the original Pegasus are now gleaming and in first-class order. But then, what do you expect from Rolls-Royce?
Back at the Fenton's workshop at Seton Ross near Brough, the nearly new swordfish tailplane is small enough to be taken back for covering. After the wings and tailplane have been stitched and doped, stringing takes place. This is where the tautened fabric is stitched onto the individual ribs to prevent fabric slippage. This is a nostalgic moment for Margaret Bennett as she recalls her days stringing string bags. So we used to string them. Two of us worked, one at the front with the needle and the string. Push the needle through to your partner. She used to push it back from the top to the bottom. Then we would do all the, all the ribs that way. Then we used to knot it, and that was the wing completed. They would spray them, then take them through into the main shop to uh, put on the, on the planes. Happy days, happy days. Yes, there were. Apart from strength and durability, fabric-covered aircraft were, as our frontline aircraft today, painted for many reasons. Nationality, of course, squadron identity, even operational role, and sometimes personal quirk. And here is the livery selected for 5856, in the colours of the commander of 810 Squadron, whilst aboard HMS Ark Royal, summer 1939. The heart of W5856, its Pegasus engine, is delivered to Brough in pristine condition. This ubiquitous power plant was one of several outstanding air-cooled radial engines designed and built by Bristol's and was fitted to numerous single and multi-engined aircraft of the time. This version is the Pegasus 30 a nine-cylinder unit capable of providing 750 horsepower at 4,750 feet. This would propel a swordfish torpedo bomber at 138 miles per hour at 5,000 feet. Fitting 5856's wings proved the first real obstacle in the assembly, and it eventually took two days to get it right. With twice as many wings to fit, alignment and rigging seemed to be eight times more difficult. Not only did the outer panels have to fit the stub wings accurately, but the folding geometry had to be perfect. Added to this was the strutting and wire bracing between each pair of wings, the correct dihedral angle and incidence. But, as with all other temporary problems encountered, the problem was eventually solved, and wings to fly it had. However, one problem that was unfolding behind the curtain could have led to a serious snag. Propeller balancing using the static display swordfish from Leon Solent. Not only does an unbalanced propeller cause serious vibration, but it can ruin an engine. Either way, I don't think we're going to be able to balance it using any any lead wool or, or washers at the moment. Because it's, it's too much to balance. Yeah, and I, I don't think you get the weight, the equivalent weight there. I mean, if we weigh that, to get that with washers, I think, 
I think we'll be very lucky. We'll need some very dense, heavy washers. Yeah, so. The problem is, if it, if it was released, not, not with a statement not saying that it's balanced, then you don't know what you're working with from the beginning, do you? If you knew it was balanced before you painted it, you'd know that it was the paint that was throwing it out. The same as what we do in the workshop. <coughs> no, I think from an initial uh, balancing checks of the prop, it looks as though we're either going to have to restrip the paint off one blade and uh, try and apply in a, a thinner coat of paint, or possibly at the worst, uh, regrinding that blade, which would really set us back some time. So, off with the paint. An unenviable task for Trevor Bruin. The offending blade had to be ground down to reduce its weight. All this took place under the watchful eye of Colin Webb from H&S Aviation. Mm, must take it off, doesn't it? This, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I think what we're going to have to do is we'll have to get it as closely as we can without the paint on, and that, that then allows you, gives you leeway for when you paint it to put it on evenly. If you then find afterwards you've got a slight drop off, I think the only way out of it is to give it just one, maybe an extra coat on the relevant blade, just to make that one heavy, because you're going to have to balance it after we've done this and painted it again anyway. In the end, all was well. Now it was full steam ahead for completion of the Bruff Swordfish, with dates for first engine runs and maiden flight firmly in the diary. Contact. A splutter, a cloud of smoke from the rich mixture, and away she goes. With the first engine run an instant success, relief was a well-earned luxury for all concerned. This must be a great day, Trevor. Great, yeah, it's, it's uh, magnificent to see it going, you know, after all these years, all this work we've put in, really good. Yeah, really pleased about it. Best time as well, superb. Very happy up to now. As long as everything, when them two chaps get out in that cockpit, they're highly delighted, we will be. First time. First time, pretty amazing after two and a half years. We've achieved it, brilliant. The shelter of the hangar, it feels as almost there's no wind at all. If you have a look out there, it's blowing like hell. Fine. 
W5856, again about to fly, represents not only a tribute to all those brave pilots, nags and tags who flew swordfish operationally for nearly 10 years, but to the Fairy Design Office, whose vision resulted in such a masterpiece. The Fairy and especially Blackburn production teams, and all those directly or indirectly involved in the magnificent two and a half year restoration. May it fly for many years to come and serve as an inspiration for future generations. W5856, 52 years young and a string bag reborn. Bon voyage.